What's up, St. Philip family? St. Faustina, the Polish nun who brought us the Divine Mercy image, who has her diary, long, thick diary, where Jesus would appear to her and speak to her all the time. She'd have these conversations with Jesus, amazing nun and, and amazing saint. And one of my favorite stories is Jesus appeared to her and said, Faustina, I would like you to ask permission from Mother Superior for you to wear a hair shirt for seven days and to get up once each night to go to the chapel. And so Faustina then goes to Mother Superior and says, Mother Superior, can I have permission to wear a hair shirt for seven days and to get up each night, once each night to go to the chapel? And Mother Superior says, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I do not give permission for that. If you had been given the strength of a Colossus, I may have given you permission for that, but you may not do any such thing. So then after the Mother Superior leaves, Jesus appears and Faustina says, Jesus, Mother Superior did not give me permission to do what you asked. And Jesus said, I was here the whole time you had that conversation. It's not by these acts of mortification, but by obedience that you will please me. He said, "Her acts, your acts of obedience give me glory and bring great merit to you. That obedience more than anything is what pleases the heart of God. It was by disobedience, Adam and Eve. Disobedience, when they, psh, one thing that they asked, that God asked them to do, they disobeyed God and we lost the divine life. All of that was ruined by this disobedience and it was through the obedience of Jesus Christ who was obedient even unto death, even death on the cross. He was obedient to God and therefore he redeemed us redeemed us through obedience. And it wasn't easy for Jesus. He didn't want to obey. He said three times in the garden, he said, Father, please let this cup pass from me. Please let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. And this is why obedience is so pleasing to God, because it's not about my will. It's all about the will of God. And so when I'm obedient, I'm showing that I'm submitting myself, submission, my mission under the mission of God, my mission under the plan of God for my life. And so I will obey him. And, you know, those of you who are parents or have employees or any kind of role of authority, how amazing does it feel when your children or employees, when they obey you, like right away, you ask them to do something and even like, it's not just obedience, but they do it joyfully, like, of course, or yes, mom, yes, dad. This beautiful obedience, it's so good. It's so good, it feels so good. Because as the parent, when, when your children are obedient to you, it's, it's this perfect proof, this sign. They do love me, they do trust me, and now there can be order in our house, in our home. So wonderful. And even for those who are obeying, the child. So I know for me, even when I am able to be obedient even now to my parents, I know how much it delights them and I feel good. I'm like, wow, I made my mom or my dad so happy because I listened. Obedience actually means to listen. So I listened to them and I obeyed them and I obeyed them joyfully. And there's this beautiful reciprocal love and peace and order that comes from obedience, the gift of obedience. And if I'm pleased when my children obey me, and I'm an imperfect parent or employer or whatever, I'm imperfect. And, and like, I mean, I'm still trying to do my best, right? When I ask them to do something, I'm not just trying to impose something on them. I mean it for their good or for the, for the good of the mission. I know it's good for our home or for them individually. And so I love when they obey, when they listen, because I know it's good for them and it's good for us. And so when, if I am who am imperfect, if I know that pleasure, that, that joy, how much more so does it please God when we obey? It's so beautiful. It's so pleasing to him. Nothing is more pleasing to him than obedience more than any heroic act, more than anything that we could possibly do, any great show of our love for God, more than anything is the obedience that we show him and that we show those who are placed in 
authority over us, obedience. And that's, that's important, right? So we talked about last week sacrifice as a sign, as a proof of our love for God, but obedience is a proof of our love for God. That, you know, it's, words are cheap. When I tell someone that I love them, I, you know, it's a nice thing to say, but it's not just the words, but it's show me how you love me. Show me by your life that you love me. And so with God, it's, we can say that we love God. I can say that I love God, that I talk to him all the time, that I'm in, on, that, that God is, you know, the most important part of my life and all these things, but show God, show God that you love him. We need to show God that we love him. And we do this through obedience. Obedience is the greatest sign of our true love and trust in God that we'll obey and we trust that he's going to take care of us. And so when we do love someone, we look for those opportunities to prove our love. So what are the opportunities to prove our love for God? How do we obey God? Well, one thing is he gives us this awesome list called the Ten Commandments. And it's this list of all these different things that are a sign and it's, it's obey these things. And it's a sign to me that you are obeying me and that you love me and trust me. So we prove to God our love for him by following the Ten Commandments faithfully. Our obedience to those commands are a sign to God of our love for him. And these commands are not something uh, new or something that God created and imposed on us. These are the truths that we're made for and they lead to our freedom. That's the best part, that obedience to God is not just leading to our misery. It's always leading to, as we heard in the psalm, everlasting life. That your commands, oh Lord, lead to everlasting life. That, that faithfulness to you is, is freedom, is refreshment to the soul. It's amazing to obey God. It's not just a burden. It's actually leading, leading to my freedom. So it's, it's a win-win. We prove our love for God and we're set free and we're going to everlasting life. That's the best part. So Ten Commandments lead to everlasting life if we obey them. And I want to talk about the Ten Commandments for a second because, you know, we all know them. Maybe we can't name them all in order, but we know them. If we had the word bank, we could probably figure it out and, and pull something from that. Um, but let's look at the Ten Commandments for a second. Isn't it interesting that if you were to, like if someone asked you to reflect on yourself, like, are you a good person? Are you obedient to God? If we looked in the mirror, sometimes we're like, I'm a nice guy, right? I'm a nice guy. I'm a pretty, pretty good person, you know? Yeah, sure, there are some things that I should change, but I mean, I haven't killed anyone, you know? I haven't done, right? We, that's a very common expression that we hear. Well, that's commandment number five. So it's interesting that commandments like five through 10, so the last six commandments, are usually the ones that we use to justify our life. Thou shalt not kill. What is it? Adultery, steal, lie, covet, covet, right? So like we have these, these are the things that I say, well, I don't do those things, so I must be okay. How often do we do that, right? Where it's like, well, I'm not, I don't steal from anyone. Or like a lot. I mean, I might tell a white lie every once in a while. And I mean, I'm faithful to, to my spouse for the most part, you know? And I mean, I'm not really coveting. I'm pretty happy with my life. I'm a good guy. I'm not killing anyone, you know? But that's the last six commandments, and if you look at the reading, the first reading today, look at, I want you to look at it. Look at how much time God spends on the last six commandments and how much time he spends on the other four, on the first four. Like the last six, he basically is kind of like, oh yeah, and also, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Like it's like period, 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 that's it. No explanation, just, oh yeah, and also definitely don't do these things. That's like super basic, but he spends a lot of time talking about one, talks about two, a lot of time talking about three, and he talks about four. Like those are like these big, big blocks of text. They take up most of it. And yet those are the ones that we don't really consider maybe when we are measuring ourselves against ourselves, justifying our life. So let's talk about these first four commandments. And I'll start with number four. What is commandment number four? Honor your father and mother. Such an important commandment, so important. Jesus said to Pontius Pilate, he said, you would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. That in a mysterious way, God shares his authority over us with our parents and with legitimate authority. That he actually gives parents this power 
over us that obedience to our parents and to those in legitimate authority is seen as obedience to God. That my obedience to God is actually a measure, is measured by my obedience to my parents. So it's so important. It's so important to be obedient to my parents. Not only because of what we said before, because it leads to order, it leads to peace in the home, it leads to joy to our parents' hearts. But when I obey my parents, when I say yes to them, and I listen to them, and I do so joyfully, I'm being obedient to God. And when I do not obey my parents, I'm disobeying God. And that's why it's, it's sinful to disobey my parents, because God has placed them over me in authority. Another thing to think about, too, is not just for you young children, but for our, the older children, right? Those who are in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. 70s sometimes, when our parents are still here, it can be really hard still to obey our parents. Sometimes I struggle. I'm a priest and my parents are in Cleveland it's, and it's still hard for me to obey my parents. I, I, sometimes, sometimes my mom asks me to you know, do something and I can be forgetful or um, I can be like, oh, I don't wanna do that. But obedience to them is obedience to God because they're my parents and so even when our parents are older and sometimes they become a little senile and, and kind of difficult to take care of or to, to be with, the struggles there, obedience to them is obedience to God. And even if they're asking me to do something kind of ridiculous, I mean, as long as they're not asking me to break, you know, those last six commandments, like as long as they're not asking me to do something sinful and wrong, obviously we don't do that. But if they're asking something of me, my obedience to them is obedience to God. And sometimes that's helpful. Like maybe I do struggle with my parents and it's hard to listen to them. It's hard to be obedient. I just, I want to rebel. I want to, I want to be bad and I don't want to listen. Well, okay, if you can't do it for your parents, can you do it for God? Maybe it's like this. It's like, whew, they're really, it's really difficult right now. They're on my last, I'm on my last nerve right now. And I just don't know if I can handle much more, but you know what? I'm going to obey them. I'm going to respect them. I'm going to honor them. I'm going to be kind to them. I'm going to be patient with them. I'm going to forgive them as a proof of my love for God. That God, I'm going to prove my love for you. Obedience is not always easy. Remember again the garden. Jesus said, let this cup pass from me. He said it three times. So it's not easy. But when we choose to obey, something amazing happens. Grace is born in the world. Order is brought into the world. Peace and and. Oh man, and all these wonderful things happen when we obey because we say, not my will, but yours be done. Father, not my will, but yours be done. That's how, he, that's how Jesus redeemed the world, by that act of the will. Not because he loved it and enjoyed it, but because he was obedient and acting of the will to choose our good and the will of the Father. And that's what we can do, especially when it comes to our parents. And now the other three, um, can really be boiled down to one word, Sunday, especially one and three. One being no false gods, right? You worship, I am the Lord your God and there are no other gods and you worship me. Do not make idols, do not make graven images, none of that. I am the Lord your God and you worship me alone. Worship me alone, I am the Lord your God. And then the third commandment being, keep holy the Sabbath day. And we remember what Jason said, in the mission. He talked a lot about Sabbath rest, the Sabbath day being this gift that God gives to us. He gives us this, this Sunday as a gift, a gift to be received for our good, for our rest, for our refreshment, and to keep us focused and centered on what's most important. And Bishop Barron said something really interesting. He said, you know, oftentimes, when people struggle with making Sunday the Sabbath day, and I want to do a little, little note here. If you have a particular job that doesn't allow you to Sabbath on Sunday, make sure you have a Sabbath day. I understand those of you who are in medicine, those of you who are different, you know, uh, you know, emergency service workers, all those different things. Thank you for the gift of your, your job and your career. And thank you for keeping us safe and for taking care of us. Um, but make sure that you have built into your week Sabbath rest. If even if Sunday is not the day that's possible all the time, but like try for Sunday, 
but definitely make sure you have Sabbath rest. So when I say Sunday, if it's not possible for you in that way, you're not being asked to do what's impossible, but you are asked to have this as a structure of your life. So make sure it's, it has some form in your life. But anyway, so that was a side, a side note. So Jason talks about this, the Sabbath rest, and talks about Sunday, and now I'm getting a little lost what I was saying. So, oh, Bishop Barron, he says that uh, a common thing that we hear, and I hear this a lot, when people don't make Sunday the, the Sabbath day, or when people aren't going to church regularly, or, um, you know, when they have other different struggles, oftentimes they say something like this. They tell me, well, I pray to God all the time. I'm constantly talking to God. I talk to him in the car. I talk to him at work throughout the day. I'm always talking to God. I always am saying, you know, in, in prayer. And that's wonderful. And that's actually the goal for all of us, to pray unceasingly, right? To pray without ceasing. That's the goal. That's what Jesus wants us to do. So way to go. You're doing that. But there's, there's a little problem with that. Bishop Barron says, that might be sufficient for the angels. The angels may be able to praise the Lord, worship him, and speak to him, and, and, and be with him at all times throughout the day and the different moments. Angels could do that. We have bodies. And so there's a different responsibility that my body is actually a visible sign of what I am worshiping. My body is a visible sign of what matters to me because I literally have to move my body to go to the thing that's important. I can only be in one place at one time. And so I have to physically put my body in that place. And so when I do that, and because I can't be in two places at once, I am a visible sign when I come to church on Sunday, I'm a visible sign to God that I do worship him above all things, that there are no other idols. But if I'm not coming here, right, and I'm, and I'm putting my body in a different place, am I worshiping something else? And secondly, the third commandment about the Sabbath rest, oh my goodness, our bodies get tired. My body gets tired and I need that rest and a particular rest. I need that rest of recreation, to be recreated. That's, what's, that's, what, that's why we call it re recreation, recreation, to be recreated. And the way I'm recreated is I spend time with my family, with those very important relationships. I spend time in prayer. I come to worship my God and I rest. I, maybe I read or do something or do some service, whatever. Whatever I need to get reconnected and recreated so that I do not fall into that rat race that is the rest of my life. If I don't take that Sabbath rest, if I don't stop and refocus and show God in that one moment, in that one day, in that one hour, whatever it is, that he is truly the center of my life and I worship him and no other gods, if I don't do that, I get carried away. And the final point here is, if I am not taking Sabbath rest, if I am not taking seriously that particular day that God commands me to worship him and to rest, my soul becomes like we heard in the gospel today. It becomes a marketplace filled with all of my justifications, filled with all of my other activities, filled with busyness, filled with distraction, filled with all the different things, it becomes a marketplace when it's supposed to be a place of prayer, when it's supposed to be a sanctuary, a holy place, a place of encounter with the living God. And so if maybe if, if, if you're feeling a little bit convicted by that, if you feel like your soul has really become a marketplace, I've filled it with so many things other than God, here's what I challenge you to do. I'm speaking to myself as well. You tell Jesus, Jesus, you make a whip out of, those, out of those cords and you come in there and you turn over the tables, crush the idols, drive out all the marketplace, drive out the money changers, drive out the busyness, clear a space so that I can once again encounter you and enjoy that Sabbath rest. And in that place, be so obedient to what you're asking of me. That is the obedience that I desire. So Jesus, you have full permission to wreck my soul, to open, to, to, to tear down those tables, to crush down the money changers, to drive out the oxen, to do whatever needs to happen so that I can have that beautiful, peaceful place of encounter, that place of rest, 
and in obeying you in that way, in submitting to you, putting my mission under your mission, I can be pleasing to you and the plan that you have for my life can be fulfilled. God bless you guys. And remember, God loves obedience more than anything. So obey well this week.